Good morning. morning. Welcome to all of you in the name of our Savior Jesus. We have a special week that we are celebrating here at St. Paul's. It's our annual stewardship week where we take some extra time to focus on on the three big areas of stewardship or, or management or caretaking that our Lord entrusts to us in our lives and in this world. Our time, our talents, and our treasures. So if you've had a chance to page through your service folder, you see that we have uh, a reading that is dedicated to one of each of those areas. Uh, and we'll be talking specifically about how we can serve our Lord through them today. Hopefully you saw that our opening hymn for today is hymn number 484, Brothers, Sisters, Let Us Gladly. And we will be using the service of the word for our order of service this morning. So let's turn to hymn 484. Let's sing it together after we take a few moments for silent prayer and meditation to prepare our hearts for worship. God's blessings. stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. 
but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. God, your Son became poor that we might become rich. Work in us such generous and loving hearts that we dedicate everything we have and are to your purposes and in your service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Let's continue with verse 1 of our hymn response, Lord of glory, you have bought us. first lesson from God's Word for this morning will come from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3 and 9 through 22. And we'll use this lesson to speak specifically about the time that our Lord gives to us to use in His service. When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. 
Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. That's the word of our Lord. I wonder what Noah must have been thinking on that day when God came and spoke to him. I mean, this is a lot to process here, isn't it? God was going to destroy the world because of its wickedness. But he was going to save Noah and his family. How so? Well, he told Noah that he was going to have to build an ark, a gigantic seagoing barge that was supposed to be 450 feet long, that's a football field and a half. 75 feet wide, that's 25 feet wider. 50% wider than our sanctuary is here even. And then 45 feet tall, as tall as a four-story building. And oh, by the way, Noah had to do this all by himself without any of our modern methods or machinery to help him. It's no wonder, I suppose, that God gave him 120 years to finish this project. But then on top of all that, Noah and his family were going to live inside the ark, cooped up with, with all those animals, representatives, two of each representative animal species throughout the earth, and that they would be responsible to feed them and take care of them as long as God saw fit, which in the end turned out to be at least an entire year there on the ark. Well, add to that the fact that we don't have any idea whether Noah, whether Noah had any inkling of how to carry out this kind of building project. And it sure seems like he was in quite a predicament here, wasn't he? I mean, was he any kind of builder? Had he ever worked with wood or pitch? Had he ever been on a boat or out on open water? We don't know the answer to any of those questions, but what we can say for sure is that this was a monumental task that the Lord asked of Noah. Well, maybe you have never been asked to build an ark out of your bare hands like Noah was. But sometimes it sure seems like service to God and His church can be just as insurmountable, can't it? I mean, there is so much to do. There is so much red tape involved with the state and with policies and codes and accreditation standards. There's so much that is complicated nowadays with finances and, and, and relationships and, and, and technology and everything else. Well, we might not feel like we have a lot of expertise in those areas, but our best guess is that neither did Noah here. What he did have to give, though, was his time and his effort. He gave his willingness to learn and try, and he had his trust that God knew what was best, even if he didn't totally understand the whole big picture yet. And here today as well, friends, those are gifts that we can give to God's church as well. You see, when it comes to the the ongoing function of this congregation contributing to that. What matters most of all is that we are all here together doing the Lord's work and serving faithfully in whatever capacity He's given to us. Because the truth is that every one of us is important and invaluable to the mission of God's church. You see, faithful Christian stewardship of our time isn't about what we can do, at least not at its heart. 
It's so much more about just being there alongside everyone else, being there for, for our mission and for our function together. It's so much more about just being willing to learn and try and grow and train if necessary and, and finding a way for everyone to come together to complete this, this big, beautiful puzzle that is Christian life and service in this world. So what that takes is time and investment. And taking time in this busy modern world means making time for service and stewardship. Now I know I don't have to tell any of you how busy we all are. That's just the world today. But I also hope I don't have to tell you how much your God loves you and wants your commitment and how much we Christians need each other. We make time for the things that mean the most to us. So for the sake of our Savior, friends, let's make sure we are purposefully and intentionally making time to serve Him. And whether it is ushering at church or serving hot lunch over in the school or being a room parent or, or, or walking alongside a parade float. Maybe it's being a part of a congregational meeting or work day or mowing team, whatever else it might be, we can prioritize it and put it on the calendar and plan around it. Noah, he gave maybe as many as 120 years of his life to building this ark. So maybe we too can give three years of our lives to serving on a congregational committee or, or board. Maybe we can give three weeks of our lives to serving in our Sunday school program. Whatever it may be, the fact is there are all kinds of opportunities to take part in the mission and work of this congregation. You can just take a look at that, that time and talent survey that came in the service folder today to see all of the different ways that you can serve God as a part of this congregation. And, and by all means, if you have other ideas, bigger, better ideas, then, then please share. We are more than happy to hear. In Christ's church, everyone has a place. Everyone has a voice. Everyone has a part to play. It's just a matter of taking the time and seizing the opportunity. No, dedicating yourself and your time to God's service in this modern world, it's becoming not much more popular nowadays than it was back in the days of Noah. But we do it for the same reason that Noah did. He believed that his faith in God and his faithfulness to God was the only thing that really mattered in this life and the only thing that would make it through the flood and into eternity. And we can serve with that same confidence now, friends. So like Noah, let's follow God's Word in faith. Let's be thankful for all the time and opportunities our God gives us to serve together. And let's all be united and engaged to take advantage of them for His glory. Let's turn back to the service folder and let's sing our next hymn response. Verse 2 of hymn 486.
Our second lesson from God's Word for this morning comes from uh, Paul's letters to the Corinthians. First and second Corinthians selected verses and chapters there. This lesson will speak specifically to the treasures that our God gives us and how we can use them in His service. Now about the collection for God's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich." And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's the word of our Lord. Yes, I know what you are probably thinking. Money is a dirty word in the church. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to hear about it. We don't like it to be in the church. And yet, there is nowhere more important for us to talk about money and how to use it than here in God's house. Because it is our God who gives us our money in the first place, and it is our God who is the only source that we can really trust about how to use it well. You see, we all have a sinful, selfish part of us deep down that doesn't want to follow God and would much rather take and hoard than give and share. It's that part of us that those kinds of attitudes come from. But that is not what controls us as God's people anymore. We follow Christ now in joy and love and thanks. So let's try to get by that, that awkward discomfort right away here. I'm not planning on shaking anybody down before you leave. I'm not going to ask you to hand over your W-2s. All I want is for us to open our hearts to listen to what our good and gracious God has to say about how we can best use the treasures He gives us and really grow in our lives of faithful Christian stewardship. And the, uh, the letters that Paul shares here to the Corinthians really give us some great principles to do just that. Paul was instructing the Corinthians here about how to show love to his neighbors or how they could show love to their neighbors and, and particularly to their fellow believers in practice. Well, Paul was no fool about how the human heart works. And so he told the Corinthians here, he gave them some important guidelines and reminders to help them be organized and regular in their giving so that it didn't fall by the wayside because of selfishness or carelessness. And what Paul told the Corinthians here, what Paul tells us still today, is that our Christian giving should be intentional and purposeful and generous and properly motivated. You see, the first thing for us to understand here is that what truly matters about any of our offerings, whether they be time or talents or treasures or whatever else, is that it isn't the substance or the sheer amount of the offering that matters in God's sight. It is the attitude of faith that comes from a generous heart of love and thanks to God. And that's going to dictate all the other details of the offerings we give. Take, for example, the story of that poor widow in Jesus' day, the story of the widow's might. You remember, maybe remember that one, who came to the temple and gave those two tiny copper coins, almost completely worthless copper coins in the grand scheme of things. Well, Jesus says that she put in those two coins and that was everything she had to live on. Now, 
it maybe didn't mean a whole lot to anybody else. Jesus says that nobody even really even noticed what she was doing. And yet, whatever may have lacked in the size of her offering, Jesus says, was more than made up for by the size of her trust. She may not have known exactly how, but she knew that God would care for her and would give her everything she needed, regardless of whether she kept those coins for herself or not. Truthfully, she wasn't just giving that fraction of a penny to God that day. She was giving her whole self into God's hands. And our Savior promises that that kind of generosity and faith will surely be noticed and blessed. You see, Jesus used that widow's example to teach us the same thing that Paul is talking about here. What matters in God's sight isn't the amount of our offerings as such. It's the proportionality. God wants us to give in proportion to our income. Yes, that is true. But most of all, our God wants us to give in proportion to our love and thankfulness to Him for everything He has done for us. Our God doesn't want us to just give Him our leftovers, our surplus, no matter how much that might be. No, our God wants us to give our first fruits. He wants us to have that kind of attitude that prioritizes supporting the Lord's work first and foremost. So friends, let's learn this lesson about the privilege and joy that is generous stewardship of the treasures that our God gives us. God has blessed each of us richly. And now He asks each of us to return a portion of our blessings back to Him in love and thanks and support for His gospel ministry that brought us all the greatest blessings that we have in the first place. See, for Christians... Not giving back to God, that just isn't an option. The, the Savior who was rich yet for our sakes became poor so that we through His poverty might become rich, He makes that unthinkable for us. Our God is so good to us and so generous to us that how could we not be generous to Him in return? No, let's use our offerings to prove our love for our Savior and to support His work so that more and more people can come to know Christ this way along with us. Yes, ministry costs money. It's true. But what is just as equally true is that the more money we have, the more and better ministry we can do together. So when you go home, again, I want you to take a look at that stewardship tools packet that came along in your service folder today. I want you to give special thought to how fully and how well your family is supporting gospel ministry here at St. Paul's. Maybe give special thought to how you can help us overcome our operating debt or maybe set aside a nest egg for, for that school expansion that we're potentially talking about in the near future. Or maybe think about signing up for Simply Giving. That's our, our, our simple, easy, straightforward program that ensures that, that you are prioritizing your offerings in the regular, intentional, cheerful way that God wants. So friends, remember that in God's eyes, how much or how little you have, that's not what matters. No, let's all simply give God the best we have to give, faithfully, generously, proportionately. Because that's what Jesus did first for us. And we know that we can never outgive Him. Let's go back to the service folders and let's sing verse 3 of our hymn response.
verse of the day for the stewardship weekend comes from the New Testament book of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, which reminds us that living our lives as faithful stewards of God is not a burden or a chore. It is a privilege and a gift of His grace. Alleluia. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Alleluia. Out of respect for the words and works of our Lord, please stand for the gospel lesson. Today's gospel comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 12 through 26, and will speak specifically to the talents that our Lord gives us to use in his service. Jesus said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas, Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit, so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, Take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. That's the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. There is really nothing unclear or unfair about the master's command to his servants here. Put this money to work until I come back. There were no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This, matter, this master had expectations that he wanted to see fulfilled. And by all accounts, he had set his servants up perfectly well to fulfill them. Before this nobleman headed off to be crowned king, he called together ten of his servants and he gave them each a mina, which was a coin or a, a, a kind of money that was worth about three months' wages. So a fairly good amount here. Well, while he was gone, those servants did whatever they saw fit with the money they were given. And then when the king returned, we see here three of those servants reporting back to him. Well, two of the servants, they were commended by the king for the work they did. They were put in charge of some of his cities. But then that last one was condemned and lost everything. This is a story that maybe comes off as just a little bit harsh and a little bit cold at first glance. But yet this is a story that bears in it some pretty important truths when it comes to our stewardship of the talents that our Lord gives to us. And maybe more than anything, this reading really speaks to that idea that we are stewards. We are caretakers or managers of something that does not truly belong to us. I mean, think about where all that money came from in the parable. 
it wasn't the servants. It wasn't theirs. It came from the Master. He gave it to them. He entrusted it to them to be used faithfully and in accordance with His wishes. And the same goes now for us too with everything our Lord has given to us in our lives as well. The same thing goes for those special gifts and abilities each of us has today. They come from the giver of every good and perfect gift. And He gives them to us for a reason so that we can use them in His service. You see, when God gives us a blessing, He always gives it to us for a purpose. He gives blessings to us so that He can give blessings through us. Just like in this parable that Jesus told in our Gospel lesson for today, our God, He didn't give us our gifts to be hidden or hoarded. No, He gave us our gifts to be utilized and shared. And that is a truth that's important for us to come to terms with here today. There are lots of people here at St. Paul's who are very special, who have unique talents and abilities and skills and training that not just anybody else does. We have people who are big and strong. We have people who are very wise and intelligent. We have people who are very people savvy or technologically oriented. We have people who know how to do plumbing or electrical or construction work. We have people who are very skilled with financial planning or budgeting or investments. And I know that that is only scratching the surface of the many gifts that our God has given to His people at St. Paul's. Well, our God gives us those talents as gifts of His grace purely because He loves us and delights in us And because He wants us to use those talents, those skills and abilities to provide for ourselves and for our families and for our communities and yes, for our congregation too. God has given each of those talents to us so that we can serve those around us in love and glorify His name in return for all of His goodness to us. That's what He wants to see and that's what He loves to see. So then I think what a neat way it was, a special comfort it was for this master in our parable here to commend his servants. Did you notice that he did not commend them based strictly on their results? No, he commended them based on their attitude. He, wasn't, he didn't focus most of all about the, the extra money they earned. No, what he was most delighted with here was the fact that they were trustworthy with what they had been given. So maybe that means if you are feeling a little bit left out here at St. Paul's, like you don't stack up to some other people, you you don't shine quite as brightly as others do, you don't need to feel that way anymore. God doesn't want you to feel that way because your life and your service to God has nothing to do with comparing yourself to others. It has everything to do with being faithful to your loving Lord and the gifts that He has given to you. No service to God, it is not a matter of whether you have gifts or not. It's a matter of identifying what gifts you do have and then putting them to use and applying them in the life and in your life and in God's church. Yes, it is true that some people's gifts are a little bit more obvious and out there than others. But sometimes those whose gifts make them more fit for behind-the-scenes kind of service are actually the ones who are most valuable to our mission and function. I mean, think about it. Isn't the shingles and the siding the things that you see that are, that are the things that keep a house standing? It's the foundation. It's the thing that you don't see. And you too can be the foundation of God's church when you stop worrying about the gifts you don't have to give. And when you just start giving the gifts that God gave you to give. And maybe that's your your example of love and respect for your spouse or your children or your neighbors. Maybe it's your dedication to growing in God's Word. Maybe it's your kindness or your patience or your service or your encouragement or your counsel or your prayers. Maybe it's your tender care for those people who do tend to go unnoticed or whatever else it might be. Let's forget 
those fears and excuses that can tempt us to turn into that third servant. And let's remember that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is ready and eager to say to us too, well done, my good servant. Yes, you too have been given a mina, a special trust from God. And that means that you too have unique gifts and talents and abilities to use in His service. So friends, let's use them faithfully, well, and to His glory. Amen. Let's turn back to the service folders and let's sing verse 4 of our hymn response. I invite the children to come forward now for the children's sermon. Mr. Brown will lead. Thanks for coming up here. Have a seat. Got a special message for you today about what we're talking about in church today. So, I brought something along with me. Pretty colorful. I have to admit, I didn't wrap it. Mrs. Brown wrapped it. She does a very good job wrapping gifts. Now, you would get something like this when you have a birthday or at Christmas time. And when you get a present like this, you can expect that there would be something pretty special inside, and you can't wait to rip it open and find out what it is. I'm just going to leave that right there. Now, boys and girls, when God made you, he gave you gifts too. Not the kind of gifts that are in a box, but he gave you gifts that are on the inside of you, and those gifts are called talents. Talents are the things that you are good at. Are you good at anything? What are some things that you think you are good at? Azalea is very good at doing somersaults. Somersaults, all right, using our bodies. What else can we say that you are good at? Yes? I'm really good at doing class. You're what in class? I'm really good at doing class. You're, you're really good at doing class in school? Maybe you're a good listener and you follow directions. Oh, crafts. Oh, great. You're a good artist. All right. Wonderful. Okay. How about you? What are you good at, James? Running. Running. Excellent. Now, you could be good at a lot of different things. If you are good at crafts or if you're a good artist, right, you could do, use those gifts in your lives. If you are a good singer, you could use your gift, your wonderful voice to give praise to God. Maybe you're good at being a friend. Now, God tells us in 1 Peter 4, verse 10, that each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. So think about what God has blessed you with, what gifts God has given you on the inside, your talents. If God has given you the gift of being a good friend, if someone is lonely or they're feeling left out, then you could be a friend to them. If someone is having a bad day, maybe you could use your gift of being an artist and draw a picture and really make their day. 
Or maybe if you are blessed with being a wonderful singer, you can sing your praises to God. Right? So, today I want you to think about how God has given you gifts. And he's given us each talents. And see if you can find a way to use those gifts and share those talents with others. And when you do that, not only are you sharing those gifts with others and serving others, but you are showing love to God. And you're saying thank you to God because he is the one that gave you those gifts in the first place. Okay? Look for your talents and use them. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you have blessed each of us with special gifts. Please help us to show our love for you as we find ways to share our gifts with others. Amen. All right, kids, thanks for coming up. Let's continue our service now with verse 5 of our hymn response. Let's continue now to confess together our common Christian faith with the Apostles' Creed. It's printed for you on the bottom of page 9 in your service folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's continue now by bringing our thank offerings to our Lord. I'd ask that while the offering is being collected, please sign the friendship registers that are located at the ends of your pews and tear out the sheets and put them on top of the booklets when you're done. Thank you.
congregation may remain seated, I would ask our Sunday school teachers to please come forward. Dear friends in Christ, you have been called as teachers in the Sunday school program of this congregation. You are doing the work the Lord has committed to his church to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make disciples of all nations, and to feed the lambs of the Lord Jesus. You do this work on behalf of St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church and in association with the parents who entrust their children to your instruction and care. Your work is both a great privilege and a serious responsibility. To equip yourselves for this blessed work, it is necessary that you faithfully study God's word, devote yourselves to prayer for those entrusted to your care, and carefully prepare for the lessons you will teach. It's also of great importance in the teaching of the Savior's little ones that you set an example by leading Christian lives. I now ask you in the presence of God and of this congregation, are you willing to accept this responsibility and to do your work faithfully according to the ability God has given to you? If so, answer, yes, and I ask God to help me. Yes, and I ask God to help me. I now install you as teachers in the Sunday School program of St. Paul's Evangelical Lutheran Church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May God give you His Holy Spirit and give you wisdom and strength to carry out your duties to His glory and for the good of His children. I'd ask the congregation to please stand then. Members of St. Paul's, I urge you to regard these teachers as servants of Jesus Christ, teachers of the gospel and God's gifts to His church. Support them in their work Pray for them and bring your children to Sunday school so that you and your families may receive the eternal blessings the Lord promises to those who hear and learn his word. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious Savior, you bless every effort to bring children up in the Christian faith. We ask you to give wisdom, kindness, and perseverance to teachers who feed your lambs. Teach them your truth so that they may teach others. Cause the children entrusted to their care to be eager to learn about their Savior. May your goodness go out into all the earth so that people in this community and everywhere may hear it and believe it. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Then go in the peace of the Lord. May the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and keep you. You may return to your seats. Let's continue then with our prayer of the church and then the Lord's Prayer. That responsive prayer of the church begins on page 10 in your service folder. Lord of our lives, by sending your Son to live and die as our perfect substitute, you provided forgiveness and salvation for a world of sinners. We praise you for your generous saving love. And we thank you for reaching out to each of us personally with your word and sacraments. You have set us apart as people who belong to you. People whose purpose in life is to receive your love and live to your glory. Gracious Father, remind us that you have called us to live for you and not for ourselves or according to the standards of the world. Help us devote our time, our talents, our energy, and whatever you have placed into our hands to those things that will be of value for eternity. Help us to love you and others and to use things as you desire, instead of loving things and trying to use you and others for our own selfish desires. May our hearts belong to you completely so that our lives can be devoted to things that really matter. Bless all who are suffering or in need. Be with the lonely and the grief-stricken. Move us to use the unique gifts you've given each of us to bring comfort and help to those who need it. Bless the government and the church and make us blessings to both. Lord, we also ask you to be with the family and friends of Hal Tesh, 
who went home to heaven to be with you last Sunday, as well as with the family and friends of Elmer Nussendorfer, the brother-in-law of Lauren and Mary Ann Bloomquist, who went home to heaven to be with you recently as well. We thank you for giving them such long, full lives of opportunities to serve and glorify you, and we thank you for fulfilling their hopes by now bringing them to the eternal joys of heaven. Be now with those of us who grieve here on earth. Give us hope too, so that we can be confident that one day we will see our loved ones again and together behold you face to face. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Crush the selfishness that comes to us naturally and fill us with joyful generosity. Grant that the gifts we bring to you may show that we are just as diligent and just as interested in carrying out your business as we are in carrying out our own. We dare to ask all this, Father, not because we deserve to ask it, but because your Son has earned for us the right to approach you as your dear children. Amen. And we join in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue with our next hymn. It's hymn number 483, Lord of All Good. Please stand for the closing prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
You may be seated. Let's continue now with our closing hymn. It's hymn number 485. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 and 6 of We Give Thee But Thine Own. 